Okay, so good morning, everybody. As I said, mentioned in the, the introduction there, I am also, uh, well, previously a member of staff at Plymouth, now a, a visiting professor with the university. So uh, I'm sort of part of you and also separate from you at the same time. And yeah, as, as was mentioned, and as you can see on the screen, uh, the title of today's talk is well, posing the question, surely we've said enough about passwords at this stage, um, and passwords are something that we fully understand and must, almost by instinct and by default, get right these days because we've spent so many years getting things wrong with them. So that's the question, and I think as I go through the, the slide set, you'll probably find that, well, I don't think we have said enough about passwords, not least because I've written a paper about it recently and I want somebody to talk to about it. So that, that's the basis for this. So, all right. So, oh dear, um, that's not a very extensive uh, slide introduction. <laughs> is it? P, P is for password. Um, so passwords have been part of our cybersecurity landscape for years, I'm sure, without having to get a show of hands or anything like that. Not only do you all use them, I'm sure you've had to use them even today, maybe even multiple times. And yeah, they've been around for so long. The use of passwords even predate us calling this discipline, if we call it that, cybersecurity. The computer security, information security, passwords have been around throughout all of that. And as it says there, for much of that time, they've been roundly criticized because you know, quite often they, they don't provide the level of security that really we need. And often the reason that they don't do that is down to the way that we use them. So, you know, to spoil one of the surprises there, it's our fault it is basically the, well, at least the assertion a lot of the time. So as I was alluding to at the, start, the very start there. So by now, in 2023, after we've had four or five, maybe six decades of passwords being used in some shape or form, you might assume we'd have got the swing of it and we know how to do it properly. Um, but actually, not only do we as users still tend to, to have issues in terms of how we use them, the, the sites and services and systems that ask us and indeed require us to use passwords still often aren't necessarily playing their part in the process. So what we're looking at in this presentation, when I, when I finally get to that point, is looking at recent practice on 10 leading websites. So that's what I've looked at as a benchmark. And as I should explain, I've done this a number of times over the years to see, OK, how well are we as users being served in terms of the guidance we're provided with and the level of enforcement that's applied to try and make sure we do things properly, OK, to support us in the right direction to using passwords, choosing them, um, imagine them appropriately. And to be honest, while passwords are going to be the focus throughout the discussion, there is a wider point to be made here about the extent to which users are, or in fact aren't, being supported in terms of understanding and using cybersecurity more widely. Passwords are such a common thing and you know, such a routine part of use that it's one area you'd expect to get us to get it right. And if we can't do it with that, what chance have we got in supporting users effectively in the various other cybersecurity tasks and challenges that they face? So that's the, that's the premise of the talk. And actually, why am I talking about it anyway? Because if you read, do a web search for passwords, one of the things you'll find, and you can search for this term, passwords are dead, and you'll find you know, that that's been asserted, well, all the way back there to 2004. So, uh, you know, predicting the death of the password there. Um, and this was this was Bill Gates, um, then um, the chairman of Microsoft, obviously Microsoft founder originally, um, co-founder, I should say, to recognize uh, the late Paul Allen, um, get your computer history correct there. Um, and he was predicting the death of passwords, yeah, what is it now, almost two decades ago. And yeah, more recently, Back in 2020, Microsoft were predicting that the following year, 2021, we remember that far back, we were just emerging from lockdowns and things, that was the year passwords were going to die. So they hadn't, they hadn't died in the intervening period. Perhaps they were going to die then. No, they didn't. So I, I've, I've got my predicted gravestone there that you know, maybe they'll, they'll die out this year. I don't think they necessarily will. We've got perhaps more chance uh, of... of Password being superseded by other things, and we already see in certain contexts that we're not front and center using passwords as our sole authentication process on some of our devices. I'm sure you're very familiar with using biometrics on your devices, but quite often still, that's not 
the only authentication technique that's in play. The, the biometric is being used as a front end for something that ultimately is still password or passcode based. OK. So. What are the problems with passwords? And I mean, really, are there any problems? Well, yeah, maybe there are because this slide sort of gives them away. And yeah, so think about the ones here that you can relate to from your your personal practice, or you know, perhaps if you're not willing to reflect upon it too much, what you believe other people do with their passwords. So one of the, the issues, and perhaps the the prominent one that gets headlined in media coverage, etc., as we shall come and see, is around the poor choices that we make in terms of passwords. So they're often, we use passwords that are too short, that makes them more readily crackable. Um, we use common words, which makes them again, more crackable, more discoverable. We use personal information, so people can have potentially a chance of social engineering out of us, or perhaps even know it already about us, if, we are, if, if we're if we talking about people who are friends, contacts, family of us already. So that's one potential area of weakness. Another, at least if you read the textbooks, et cetera, um, is we write passwords down. OK, um, I think the, the thing there to, to, I suppose, characterize a bit more is people writing them down and leaving them in discoverable places is the issue here, because I think many of us now have got passwords written down in some form because you store them in password managers, password safes, and perhaps other contexts where you believe the password is, you know, noted down in a, in a location that is in itself secure. So as long as the place where they're written down, to use that sort of general term, is secure, that's fine. The problem is, you know, if we have the stereotypical thing of people writing them on post-it notes and sticking them on the monitor or under the keyboards and all of this sort of thing in the top of drawers that aren't locked, where somebody else could come across them. Um, the fact that we retain them for long periods, this again is sort of the, one of the historical sort of textbook things here. People don't change their passwords. Well, actually, these days, the guidance is that we shouldn't change the password, because if we're forcing users to change them repeatedly, frequently, the chances are we increase the chance of them making poor choices or writing them down or doing something else that, that perhaps weakens the process. So actually letting people choose a decent password and retain it for a long period is okay, as long as we're giving people the opportunity to identify if there's been a compromise by some other means. So for example, reporting the last access time to a system or service that's using the password. So you can you can tell, oh, there was an access at three o'clock in the morning, that wasn't me because I was asleep, for example. Um, the same on multiple systems. Now I'm sure, um, I always say this in presentations, I'm sure nobody sort of watching now and listening to this is saying, well, I, I, use the same password on multiple systems. Why would anybody do that? I choose a different password for every single system that I use and put your hand up now sort of virtually or on the screen. If you do indeed use a different password for every system that you use. And I don't see any hands up because people do often use the same password on multiple systems. But, oh, Assad uses a different one on, on every so that it's very, oh, you're using the same one. Oh, that's right. So we we do this because it makes our life easier and it's very difficult to manage multiple passwords across multiple systems and remember which one is for which unless you're, you're quite regimented using password managers etc to support you and in many cases you don't want to go through the effort of choosing a new password for every site or system that demands it because well, why do you want to put that effort in for those sites in some cases they seem to be almost throw away passwords to you or throwaway sites because of what you're, you feel you're storing on them. So I think that the, the most common practice, I guess, is that people have a range of passwords and apply them differently in different places. So for a particular system, you might go to the effort of choosing a new password. But for, for certain things, you'll use the same thing in multiple places. So these are common areas of criticism. But which of these are actually avoidable? So can we stop people making poor choices? Well, potentially, I would say it is possible to avoid this if we guide them appropriately or if we have things on the system that, for example, stop you choosing a password that's too short or based on common words, etc. You might not be able to stop people using all the things that actually turn out to be personal information about them, but some of the baseline things like reusing their name as their password, you can spot that if you collect what their name is, etc. Can you stop people writing them down? Well, you can at least guide them to not do it or to guide them to do it and do it in a, a secure place. 
Can you stop people retaining them for long periods? Well, if you want to do so, and in many organisations still, you do find the situation. I know you do, you do get required to choose new passwords on a more regular basis, so that can be achieved if that's what you want to do. Can you stop people having the same password on multiple systems? Well, if you've got a password manager and it's looking at what you do, it will warn you that you've already used a certain password in another place. And again, if you guide people as to why this might not be the best practice, certainly to have the same password in every system that they use, etc., then again, by appropriately supporting people, doesn't guarantee that we're going to get rid of that as a problem, but we can take a step towards it. But, you know, what could possibly go wrong? Um, you know, why would we guide people anyway? Because people quite clearly can choose great passwords for themselves when left to their own devices. That evidence by this table here from, well, a couple of sources, originally Splash Data and more recently NordPass. And this is what gets published each year around sort of late November, early December, if I remember correctly, as the most common passwords. I've not updated this to include the 2022 ones. I, I should have done that. Um, because in 2022, the word password actually leaps back up for the top of the list. Um, and one, two, three, four, five, six falls down to position number two. Um, and so what we see here is over time, things don't seem to change a lot. People are choosing passwords that are perhaps not the best choices and consequently quite predictable as well. So if you're sat there thinking, or, and you know, as you might be, um, if you've not been guided otherwise, that password is a good choice for your password, or one, two, three, four, five, six is a valid choice because the thing insists on at least six characters, and those are six characters, you know, which is clearly the thought process that some of these users have gone through, then that's what people often choose. And I say that this is not just you know, a sample of one user and their passwords over the years. This is consistently over time, over the course of a, a decade here, the same sort of picture emerging. So what you often get in parallel with this is coverage that suggests it's the user's fault. So see, these are some of the, uh, you know, the, the extracts from accompanying news stories and, and the press releases and, and reporting of this list each year that it's been released, or some of the years it's been released. So people are doing exactly what they're not supposed to do. Some people never learn painting a big target on their backs. Even the least competent hackers could hit with their eyes closed. Unfortunately, passwords keep getting weaker. People still don't main prop maintain proper password hygiene. So that's it. It's our fault, your fault, in actual fact, because you know, you're part of this. You potentially choose these, these bad passwords. Hopefully you're sat there thinking that your password wasn't in amongst this list. I should have asked you to sort of spot in the list if your password for any system or service is there and to put your hands up and sort of claim it and tell us what it is and share it with the group so that we can access your, your things. But let's not do that. Um, we get the blame. That's the, the issue here. Now, you know, perhaps, yeah, fair enough. People ought to know better. Yeah, instinctively, perhaps, you're sort of sitting there thinking, why would anyone choose the word password as their password? Because it is vaguely predictable. But some people think they're being quite original doing that. Nobody else will ever have thought of this. Or you know, why, why should they worry about choosing anything different? It's easy for them to remember because they get a prompt that says password and they just type password, and they copy it, um, and that gives them the password they need to use. Makes it usable for them, saves them having to remember something. And perhaps they don't understand anything different. OK, so yeah, the, that was you know, users in general. What about you know, the important people, the special people in organisations? So you know, that these this might have just been the run of the mill users who don't feel they've got anything particular that they need to protect. These people, chief executive officers, other people at the sea level, so your chief financial officers, chief marketing, all those sort of folks, owners of business, management more generally, these people, let's consider them special on the basis that they're likely to have access to things that are more sensitive for their organisation. So let's see the passwords they, they chose. And again, this is from the most recent, actually, from the most recent Nord Pass data. So this is the 2022 data that I didn't have in the table for whatever reason. Um, and oh, there, there's a fair degree of consistency, at least in the, the first couple of choices there. 
So don't go and do what I'm about to say, but if you were looking to see, okay, you've got the username of somebody's account who's a high level person in an organization and you were trying to sort of do some password spraying to see what might the, the potential password be on different accounts. These would be good starting points by the look of it. One, two, three, four, five, six and password would be good things to start with if you're just trying to you know, look at different accounts and see, is there a way in through some obvious options? Obviously, don't do this, but that's what attackers would be able to do. Knowing that this information is common or the, these choices are commonly made, it gives a basis in the population of an organization, let's say, is likely, unless they've been prevented from doing so, somebody will have made these bad choices to protect their account. So you're not trying all the different combinations until you lock the account out. You just try a couple of common words and see if you get a chance somewhere. Okay, so let's let's consider, not many of us to vote, so let's just consider the you know, sort of quite potential reasons. Um, you know, why do these poor passwords persist? We saw decades worth of pretty similar choices coming through. So is it because people are stupid? Well, maybe. I mean, some people are, potentially. You might know some stupid people. Type in the chat who they are. Let, let's share that with, with the group. Um, You've met me now, so I might fall into that category for you, um, particularly by the end of the presentation. You might consider that to be the case. Is it because passwords themselves are flawed? They're a, you know, they're a broken mechanism. We shouldn't be using them. We should have biometrics. We should have multi-factor authentication. We should do something more than this. That, that could be a reason as well. Or do the poor passwords persist because we let it happen? And I would say, yeah, you know, all of these are potentially valid answers, but I think the prominent one, for me at least, is because we allow it. You know, as it says there on my very useful little aid memoir box on the side, one, two, three, four, five, six at the time for, of that table had been the most common choice for nine years in the, from that study. It's not meant to be news to anybody that people choose one, two, three, four, five, six as a password. And turning around and saying, people shouldn't use one, two, three, four, five, six as a password. Look how silly they are. They? Well, you still let them do it. Whatever systems these passwords were from permitted that choice to be made. And perhaps that's not a good idea. And perhaps there's a way to block it. We know there's a way to block it. It's just that these systems weren't doing it. OK. Now, this... You might be sat there thinking, why is he telling us all this? We know all this. This isn't new. And I agree, it's not. And I'll show you how new it isn't um, from, and you might be able to read it on your screen if you sort of rein in like I'm now doing, look, close up my face, you'll like that. Um, from November 1979, this, this particular paper. So it's a little, still not as old as me, but it might be, um, might be you know, something that's 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 come along at least more recently than some of you, um, or older rather than some of you. So the, this paper, Password Security Case History, they did an assessment of 3,300 passwords, and they revealed various bad practices, even back in 1979, and even then it probably wasn't new news. And what they found was that well, people were doing things that weren't the best with passwords. They were using passwords that were too short and they were using passwords that could be found in dictionaries or other lists of common words and names. And what the paper suggested was it would be useful. It would be a good idea to introduce feedback to users that enabled them to understand a bit more about why their choice wasn't a good one and encourage them to make more secure choices. So this notion of nudging people towards better practices. 1979. Just ponder that for a minute. You know, if if you've been around for less time than 1979, this advice has been around all your life, so to speak. And yet still, it doesn't seem to be the standard way that all systems are operating quite clearly from the fact that these poor password choices were allowed to, to propagate. So a few things to think about. So passwords, yes, they're a broken mechanism. We can criticize passwords as an approach as much as we like. The method hasn't improved naturally over time, and nor notably has people's behavior with it. So we've got new generations of users, many of you born since 1979 when that realization from the previous paper came out. And yet still, you've encountered systems that have allowed you to choose 
weak passwords. You've not necessarily been nudged in all systems towards making better choices. So change the method, which we are seeing evidence of in some cases, or support people better in situations where you're going to insist that this remains the one and only method that's in use. And that's the focus of what I'm going to be talking about a bit more here. So one thing that we can think about in terms of supporting people is, you know, guiding people to, to choose passwords that are more memorable. Now, I mentioned earlier that, you know, the, the current guidance isn't to force people to change their passwords all the time. Also, the current guidance isn't to force people to choose what are term complex passwords. So I'm sure you're familiar with many systems saying, oh, you've got to choose a password that's got uppercase and lowercase and a numeric and punctuation symbol, or at least a combination of some of these. Actually, that used to be the standard guidance up until this document here from, uh, from 2017, if I remember correctly. It's probably on the cover of it somewhere in my eyesight. doesn't let me spot it. But I think this is from 2017, NIST's latest, at the time, digital um, identity guidance. And what that says is don't have imposed rules for complexity. Um, the key thing is you want to go for longer passwords. So size matters, apparently, in, in this context. Um, I thought it did. Um, and so other things, yeah, don't force people, don't have automatic password expiry, um, enable people to see the password while they're typing it, allow people to paste into the password fields, all of it motivating towards easier to use password processes. Okay, that's the, the key thing here. But key thing is, Length matters more than complexity. That's the thing that password systems ought to be guiding towards. What we see today is, you know, and this is what, five, six years beyond the, the latest version of the guidance, that many sites are still existing on the basis of old good practice. So requiring complexity. And of course, if you insist upon new numbers, uppercase, lowercase symbols, it does make the password space greater. You know, so there's if you have a long and complex password, it's more difficult to brute force it, more difficult for an attacker to use one of those tools to try all the permutations, etc. But it's not more difficult to remember, um, as you might yourself realize. So, yeah, there's other techniques that we could use to try and improve the memorability. This one is one that I wouldn't advocate, but uh, I've you know, seen this. You, know, you, you, can, you, know, you get this aid memoir prompt here. Your password is incorrect, it tells you. And so you, you choose incorrect as your password because that your password is incorrect. Well, incorrect. There we go. And, yeah, that's the, the face of the sort of user that would use that approach to memorizing things so we, we don't want to do that but there is a better there is a better approach and this is as recommended by amongst others the uh, national cyber security center who suggests using three random words three dictionary words so in other contexts you don't use dictionary words as your password but here if you combine three decent dictionary words together that gives you a long and difficult to crack password don't use torch pizza pineapple as your um password and don't use horse battery staple either because that's appeared in a, a common uh, tech sector cartoon but other actually random words um in combination give you a basis for a password you might then find it easier to remember the idea there is you're just using words joining three of them together is much something that might stick in your mind and that's if you're in the situation where you're being required to make the choice yourself now as we might realize there are many situations now where actually you've got automation anyway, where the system can suggest you a password and you can accept that choice and it will save it for you and you don't even need to get involved. So here we have an example of that. So browsers and other aspects of the system can generate passwords. So we don't, we're not put in the position of making the bad choices that, that otherwise we might have done. There's a downside. So you, you do find yourself in the position then that you'd never actually know what the password is yourself. Um, and so if you were challenged to actually remember the strong password that the system's now generated and stored for you, if you've not got the system to support you, where it's you know, sort of retrieving it from your, your local password repository or your cloud account, then you might find a challenge. And also it it doesn't help to instill the good practice in us because we're now not learning what what good looks like in terms of making the choices ourselves. 
And also, there are scenarios where this doesn't actually work. So here I've got a, a few uh, screenshots to show this. So here, okay, the password was uh, was was chosen by the browser in this particular case. But oh no, the, the site that it was trying to populate the password field for doesn't like it. it must be at most sixteen characters. And this was too long. This is too good a password for this this site. And so. They can't use the strong password. And so the option at the time I took that screenshot was just don't use it. And you force to choose one for yourself back to back to the beginning. Um, and it's you know quite a, a common situation. Um, it would seem that you find sites not accepting the, the automatically suggested variant. So here on the left, we've got, oh, it doesn't work because it required at least two numbers. And the auto generated password didn't have that. The one on the right requires 16 characters or less again. And again, you can criticize these sites because they're, as I say, sort of focusing on requiring complexity, which now the, the guidance from NIST um, say we shouldn't be doing. And similar NCSC would say the same thing, but many sites still require it, as we see. Um, oh, yeah, and this one, um, I quite like this one just for the, as it says, the irony of it. So here it rejected the, uh, the auto-generated Password, um, because as highlighted in red, passwords must be mixed case, must have upper and lower case letters. It satisfied all of the other criteria there, and quite a few criteria to, to satisfy. But what it accepted as my choice was furious, because it accepted that, um, without the quote marks around it, by the way. Um, and so that's not a good choice, um, but it accepted it. Um, and I would have thought that that ought to be on a watch list for things that you shouldn't accept. So, I mean, why did it accept it? Because it wasn't the same as my username. My username isn't password one with an exclamation mark. Um, it satisfies the, the 10 character minimum. It's alphanumeric and it has upper and lower case. Eee, not remotely predictable. And this was the login, just ironically, for a information security journal. Um, hopefully it doesn't work still like that now. Um, OK, so now this is a more recent version of the same suggestion process. And there now is a usability tweak, as I've said there, added to it. So where it, the, the site doesn't like the, the strong password that's automatically been generated, for example, it doesn't like special characters within it, you can ask for a version that doesn't have them. It still might fall foul of being too long for some systems, but it tried to recognize that. that so, so here what is it a maximum of 15 characters says the prompt above the password box so luckily when you take the special characters out um it wasn't worried about the special characters; it was worried about the length and taking those out made the password shorter okay you also get another nice little bit of automation your your keychain your password safe etc things can monitor if your password has been seen in a data leak and whether you ought to be changing it and you get a prompt and you can go to you say change password and it'll fire you through to the system where you then need to log in and go through the process of changing it it's not quite as simple as just press the button to change it and be able to just type the new password you don't have to visit each site in turn but at least it prompts you um and that happens on yeah, multiple different platforms as well. So this is the same thing from a smartphone. And you get various warnings about it. So you, you're getting more prompting, more nudging towards good behavior on some of the devices, operating system, et cetera. So you know, telling you now the password is too easy to guess. Many people use it part use the password, which makes it easy to guess, or makes it more predictable, is actually the point. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're getting towards a situation of getting more feedback for users. But that's not uniformly the case. That, that sort of thing is on our devices, okay? Um, and when we're, when we're doing things there, when we move to context of websites and things and what they tend to provide for us, not quite so, so good. And so I've labeled this 2017 and 2022. I think if you go to this, this site now, it's still the same thing. Um, so notice here, okay, the site looks different in both cases. Um, but one thing that is consistent in both cases is that there is no guidance about how to choose the password that it's asking for. So you can see there, in both cases, asking for the name, the user, first name, surname, their email address, which it wants to know twice to 
and make sure I've got that bit right. The password, it only asks for once. So if you type a password and aren't quite sure, or you think you've typed something, you've actually typed something else, it's not going to tell you that you've made a mistake, so to speak. You don't get to see what's been typed there. You might think you've typed one thing, you've actually typed something else. You won't find that out till you try and log in again and it doesn't work. Um, but one thing notably there is it's not giving you any guidance on what it expects for the password. So on the left hand side, I've already typed a few characters. So you can't see what the default prompt was on the right. You can see that the default prompt, is ju it just says new password. It doesn't say new password in brackets, minimum six characters, eight characters, whatever. It just says that's the bit where the password goes. Tells you nothing more about what it's looking for. And in fact, the only thing that's changed between 2017 and when this was updated in 2022, so that's when the interface changed, is you can select a different type of gender. So back in 2017, you could be male or female. By 2022, you can be custom as well. And that's the only difference in five years of evolution of this site. Nothing's changed with the password here. So what's the problem with this? Well, OK, the problem is that it's not giving the user any useful information about what's expected. And this is a fairly common issue. And I'm now going to illustrate it with some some stuff from over the years. So firstly, before we get into the detail, it hands up in the chat if or hands up on the interface. If you remember 2007, use your reaction button or whatever. You know, hopefully, you know, you, there's not that much time has passed. And you, know, you can remember that you existed in 2007. If you don't remember it specifically and remember what it was like, I'll give you some sort of prompts for sort of the cultural and, and sort of general societal context. So 2007 was the year of the first iPhone. And there have been at least 15 versions of the iPhone since 2007. Um, yeah, it's a while ago, life. Look, even look a bit different now. They used to have a home button, then screens were smaller, devices. Anyway, um, 2007 was the year of the movie Spider Man 3, if you're, if you're Spider Man fans. And since then, there have been two reboots of the whole Spider Man franchise um, with a total of five new movies and, and two different Spider Man actors. Um, so there's been, so that was Tobey Maguire, there's been Andrew Garfield, and there's been the other chap, the most recent one, whose name I can't, Tom Holland, there we go. Um, so there we are, I can at least remember who the most recent Spider-Man actor is. So 2007, it was Tobey Maguire's third film, right? And 2007 was Obama as his presidential candidacy candidacy, candidacy. Um, and since then Obama served two terms as president there's been this chap Trump who came and went as president and we've had well at least half a term of Joe Biden since then so this this tells you hopefully that things have changed since 2007 okay you might wonder why am I using 2007 as a reference point? Because you probably could have gathered that things have changed a bit since 2007 without me telling you this. You know, 15, 16 years ago now, depending on which bit of 2007 and now we're we're sort of uh, measuring. Well, this is why I'm bothered about 2007, or at least why I'm pointing out. Is back in 2007, I wrote a paper, um, and I wrote a paper called "An Assessment of Website Password Practices," and it. Basically, it was a study looking at what did some of the leading websites at that time do in terms of supporting users, in terms of guiding them on password choices when they signed up, when they elected to change their password, and when they reset their password. I looked at various stages of the process and also what rules were enforced at those different points. And uh, okay, that was 2007. I did that then, and I found that there was quite a degree of bad practice going on. And I shall highlight some of it as we go through. Um, the sites I examined, just again, to give you a sense of how things have, in some sense, changed, and in some sense, stayed the same. The 10 most popular sites at that point, based upon the Amazon, uh, the, the, not Amazon the Alexa Global Top 500 list of popular websites at the time, were Amazon, uh, Bebo, eBay, Facebook, Friends to Google, MSN, MySpace, Yahoo, and YouTube. And all of those that I just read out, probably you might recognize that some of them aren't really that popular anymore. In fact, about half of them 
Um, but you might remember that at one time there was a thing called MySpace and something called Fenster and something called Bebo, etc., that you used. Um, others, okay, yeah, slightly more than half to be fair, are still around and still very popular at this time. But you know, some things change from then. Now, since 2007, I've been hard up for ideas is basically the thing here. And having had a good idea once, and well, I thought it was a good idea, and it got published, so clearly it was a good enough idea. Um, I thought a few years later, I've, I've got some time available. Let's, let's see what it's like now. So sort of four years later, did the same thing or did something similar. A bit lazy by that point and didn't go through all the different levels of sign up and password change and password reset. I think by that point, I was just focusing on the sign up stage because that's the most important because that's when people establish their password. They might never change or reset it. And, and when they sign up, that's what their account is protected with. Um, a few years later, you know, slightly less of a gap, did it again. That got published. Quite good. Um, and again, and again last year. And so basically, I've got this catalogue now of these papers where every few years I've repeated this study. And I say, you might think it's because I'm hard up for ideas and just like to publish the same old thing repeatedly. I couldn't possibly comment. I'm sure Nathan might. Um, but nonetheless, five times it's got published. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about now is, is basically what I found in the most recent version of the study. All of them focused on, amongst other things, two, two things, the guidance that we get when we're first creating our password protected accounts and the extent to which good practice in whatever form it's considered to be at the time of the study gets enforced when we make those choices. And all of them were from the top 10, what I'll call qualifying sites at the time from the Alexa Global Top 500 ranking. Qualifying sites means that they were unique sites. I, so for example, in 2007, Google and YouTube were separate services. They had distinct password processes. More recently, Google and YouTube are part of the same thing. And so you use your Google sign up for YouTube anyway. So I wouldn't regard them, although they're both distinctly listed in the Alexa top 500, to, to use them both would be effectively duplicating things. And the other, well, I've got the list. Um, so here was the Alexa global top five, well, the first 17, which is as far down the list as I needed to go to find 10 usable sites for me um, for, for the 2022 assessment. So I did it about a year ago. Um, so you can see that I had to exclude some sites because they were um, written in Chinese, uh, because that's a language I don't read. And more particularly, I wanted to have a consistent base anyway. So they all needed to be using the same language and the same same sort of basis for users to be assessed. And so sort of going down, I went down to 17 in the Alexa ranking to get 10 distinct sites. And you can see the ones that have got the ticks. So one thing I was looking for was yeah, what's provided as guidance? And I've got just to show you what I mean by guidance. You had a couple of examples from some of the earlier sites where they were showing a list of things that they require. Something to tell the user what's expected. You saw manifested that those Facebook examples didn't have anything. All it told you was it wants you to type a password in the box. OK, that's guiding you towards what box to type it in, but not guiding you very much further. Um, so our users told anything prior to starting to, to choose and type their password. Is any detailed explanatory information provided? Does the user get any feedback interactively? So, for example, a password strength meter or a rating? Um, and are they told something after they've tried to submit the password if it's not appropriate? If it's not considered an acceptable password, what do they get told about it? So various bits of guidance and feedback, let's say. The other thing I was interested in, and this initial list is exactly as it was for the other versions of the study as well, regardless of any guidance, what rules get enforced? So is there a minimum password length? And if so, what is it? Do you get prevented from using your surname as your password, which rather requires that the site collects what your surname is as part of the process? Um, does the site prevent the reuse of your user ID or your email name, whatever you're using as your login thing for the password uh, for the, the site? Does it prevent that from being used as a password? Does it prevent the string password from being used as a password? Because we 
we can see even back as far as 2007 that people use that as their often as their choice. Does it filter out some dictionary words and other common choices? Um, and does it require the composition of the password to include multiple character types? So that complexity thing, which until the 2018 version of the study would have been a good thing, because that's what good practice guidance would have told us at the time. In 2018 and onwards, that's now not seen as a good thing because the digital identity guidance tell us don't enforce complexity. So we would ideally want sites not to be doing that. And for the 2022 one, I threw in an additional check. Does it stop the string password one being used? Password one exclamation mark being used with a capital uppercase P. Um, does the user get allowed to use three random words as their password? Um, I.e. does the site allow that um, or does it prevent it because they don't include special characters or numbers or something like this? So could they just use a plain vanilla three three dictionary words in a row as their password? And does the site accept the password that the browser has automatically suggested? So I got a, a browser generated password and tried that against each of the sites. So the same browser generated password, saved it, stored it and tried it in each case. And is there any additional protection um, offered um, once the users created their account? That was another thing we looked at. So is there an option, for example, to enable two-step authentication or two-factor authentication, depending on what the site calls it? So where it would send you or generate you or require a one-time code. So then, first of all, let's have a look at the extent to which there was any guidance provided. And what you can see there from the ticks and uh, crosses is it varies, um, and it varies very much according to what stage of the process something might be received. And so although there's a lot of picks and green boxes on the post attempt feedback, that's not necessarily a good thing, insofar as that's the last point at which you could actually provide the users with useful information. Because by that point, they've already made a bad choice and you're telling them, eh, uh, here's some feedback to help you make it better. What you want is something prior to them pressing return or clicking OK, that gives them some insight at an earlier stage. So we can see, for example, Facebook, as we saw from the earlier screenshot, did nothing at any of the earlier stages. But once you put an unsuitable password in, it will tell you something about why it's unsuitable, like it will tell you it requires at least six characters, um, for instance. Could have told you that before you, before you entered it. Um, none of them provide at what I've termed tangible guidance, so any link off to or any list on the screen or a link off to anything about you know, proper tips on what a strong password looks like. Some of them provide information prior to you entering your password. We'll see the nature of that information in a minute. And some of them offer you interactive feedback of some form during the attempt. Now, I put for Instagram, it's sort of me. It sort of does because the next button that allows you to proceed doesn't get enabled so it's grayed out until you've put in a password of the minimum length that's permissible so you get an indirect indication oh that's now acceptable because i can actually click the next button in the last four cases you've got a password meter or interactive messages so telling you it's not strong enough weak etc um coming up as some feedback as you type it so why do you get a what does it take to get a tick so amazon got a tip for offering prior information and post attempt feedback. So you, you look at the table here and you think, oh, Amazon does something and it provides you something, but it's not really that extensive. So um, yeah, the it applies very few restrictions. And so what it actually asks or gives you as feedback is quite minimal as well. So the prior information is simply a note under the password box that says your password needs to be at least six characters. And any choice accepting that criterion is accepted. And so the only post attempt feedback is if you still try and put in something that's not six characters or more. Um, Google provided guidance prior to the attempt, but that's all it said, use eight characters or more with a mix of numbers, letters and symbols, so it's requiring complexity. And Instagram, I explained why, uh, because of that next button that's grayed out. Now, let's go back to Post attempt feedback, you see all the, the green, you know, the green boxes with the ticks in. They give some feedback after you, you've done something to tell you the password wasn't good enough. And even that feedback isn't necessarily very helpful in some cases. So Facebook tells you you need to choose a more secure password. It then tells you 
what the length is. It needs to be longer than six characters, unique to you, difficult for others to guess. So it at least gives you some direction towards what, what good looks like. Google, it did already tell you this prior to the attempt, but it repeats the information, a mix of characters, a mix of letters, numbers, and symbols. LinkedIn, not so informative, really. Please enter a more secure password. Doesn't have any information to tell you what more secure means in this context. So you've got to work that out for yourself. And Reddit, this password, that password is unacceptable, is all it tells you. You do see there on the right hand side of the Reddit uh, box. So you've got the exclamation mark. You've got the very minimal looking password meter. So by that point, you should have already realized your password wasn't acceptable because it wasn't getting rated very high. But uh, if you still try and persist, that's the feedback it gives you, notably not guiding you towards what a better attempt would be. So, OK, you might be thinking, yeah, why does it matter? Because they're going to stop you choosing bad passwords anyway. And ultimately, the user will hit upon a combination that the system thinks is acceptable. And so all will be good in the world. Other than what they actually allow is not particularly necessarily always all that good either. So what we see here is what enforcements and, and what things were, were permitted um, by the site. So, OK, one thing that's notable, you might not think it should be notable, but it is notable. All of the sites had a minimum length requirement. This is the first time in doing the study that all of the sites sampled had a minimum length that they required. In earlier incarnations of the study, you could get a, get away with a one character password on some of the sites. Um, so that's a great level of protection for your whatever your account is is related to. Um, so some of them now, you know, it's a minimum of six characters, not exactly a great minimum. Um, so I've colored them in sort of orange because at least they've got a minimum. And eight characters is not a great minimum either, it should be said. But it's about the best you ever see on sort of common popular websites. It's about as much as they think they can get away with asking people for. I mean, as a strong password, if we wanted to characterize it properly, would be something more in the region, let's say 14 characters and onwards, because then you've got something that's resist more resistant to, to brute forcing and also to rainbow table um, attacks as well. But here, eight I mean, eight, and eight characters is quite easily crackable, but it's about as much as the sites will feel comfortable, it seems, to insist upon as your as your minimum. Um, do they prevent you using your surname? Most of them don't. Um, in some cases, because they don't collect your surname as part of the sign up process, so they don't know what it is. And in some cases, even when they do collect it, they don't prevent you using it. Um, but three sites do collect it and prevent it. So that's good. Preventing the user ID, um, which you know, all of them will be having something that, you know, what are you going to be known by on the site? And three of them still don't prevent you from using that as your password. Most, but notably not all, prevent the word password from being used. Few uh, prevent password one exclamation mark. So they think they're clever at one point and then they, they lose it all by allowing another common choice. There's some notable variation in whether they allow dictionary words to be used or common words, common strings, let's call it. And I'll show you the ones I used in a moment. In some cases, they get a tilde symbol and an orange thing because actually they are preventing some of the choices from being used, but possibly not because they've got a watch list for dictionary words, but because some of the choices were shorter than the minimum length password. So I'll show you the, the choices I use and explain them. Do they enforce composition? Only Microsoft Live did enforce composition. Um, and so that's not a good thing. So it gets a tick that it enforced it, but a red coloring because it's a bad thing to enforce. Um, Yahoo gets a, and, and Google also get a squiggly tilde symbol there because they don't require um, you to, to um, use multiple character types unless you're using shorter passwords. So for example, Yahoo, if you wanted to get away with a seven character password, it has to have multiple character types within it. Whereas if you did a nine character password, it could be all the same type of character. It could be all alphabetic, for example, and Yahoo won't complain at that point. Do they allow three random words? Just you know, three lowercase or uppercase words one after the other. I've said Microsoft Live doesn't because it insists on composition. So you can do it, but you have to mix upper and lower case in order to do it. And they all allowed the browser generated password. So that was good. And most of them 
have some sort of optional additional protection you can enable for your account so that it's not just reliant on whatever password it might have allowed you to choose. So you know, having a lesser degree of a password and two-step verification, you're strengthening the account at least if you do that. But you're not guided or pushed towards it in many of the cases. So, OK, I've said some of this already. Um, so variations in the rules said that bit about Yahoo. There's additional filtering based on predictable repeated character sequences. So two, three, two, three is not permitted, even though it's an eight character password and it has a mix of alphabetic and numeric, but it's, it's a predictable sequence. And it's got a good bit of parsing in there to prevent some other things. So adding numbers to the end of your surname and stuff like that gets spotted. Um, some of the others, um, Facebook um, captures first name and surname, as we saw, as distinct fields as part of your sign up. So it can use them to, to, to identify whether you're using those in your password. Instagram, by contrast, captures users' full name as a single field. and It doesn't parse the password to see if any of that's being used. Microsoft Live um, asks for a set of things over a series of distinct screens in that order. So it collects your name last. Um, and so it can't check your surname at the point where it chooses your password um, or where it checks your password. And Wikipedia um, doesn't ask for the user's full name or surname, so can't explicitly check for it. Um, but it does check that the username isn't used and nothing from it. So to what extent did they block these common choices and dictionary words? So what ones did I use? First of all, I used those two and they were from the most recent list of top 10 common passwords from NordPass. I use those four because they were from a prior set of common passwords from splash data lists, and they'd been used in the 2018 study as, as some of the common password strings. And I use those two because they are longer dictionary-based words, so they, they meet the eight character or more minimum for some of the sites. And here, it's the same words, but adding an uppercase letter at the start and indeed adding a number at the end for the last one. So, you know, literally dictionary word at, at the end there with a one at the end in the last variation. So to what degree were these prevented? And here we see, OK, so red is that it was allowed to be used and, and the tick in, indicating the same thing. So Amazon allowed everything. All of those passwords were fine from its point of view. Notably, not the case for Yahoo, which blocked all of them, um, which is you know, at the extremes of the chart, the what we would like to see on one end and what we'd not like to see at the other. And it's a very it's a moving picture for some of the others. Um, and so, you know, the fundamental point here is Yahoo's able to block all of them. Why weren't the other sites? able to block them as well and perhaps shouldn't they have been doing it and we see that dictionary one um, manages to you know to get through the gates in most of the cases okay so i said some of them were preventing some of the dictionary words as a result of other enforcement anyway rather than specifically filtering out the words yahoo blocked some of the the choices but not others um so uh you know uh, you know, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine was blocked as a common string, but some of the other dictionary words were allowed through. So there's not a predictable degree of consistency in terms of how, even though these are leading sites, even though they're all asking for passwords as their primary authentication mechanism, what they permit through is quite variable and how they do the enforcement. Some good news if we want that. All the sites, as I said, you allowed the browser generated password, which I've generated into the Safari browser. All of them, except Microsoft Live, for the reason I explained, allowed you to do the three random words, the hashtag think random um, guidance, as NCSC terms it. And all of them, except Wikipedia, had the two step or two factor, depending on what the site calls it, authentication. So everywhere else, you've got the option to do something beyond just having simple passwords. So how does this compare with you know, sort of 15 years earlier when I'd done the first version of the study? So back in 2007, um, eight of the sites had restrictions on the length of the password and two of them, which if I remember correctly, well, one of them was certainly Amazon. I can't remember what the other one that wasn't doing the length restriction. We might find it in a minute. Um, 
was. Um, very few of the sites then, very few now. Block surname, more block. I mean, it's not statistically significant numbers, but we see a yeah a little bit of a um, a pattern here. Um, far fewer uh, sites back in 2007 were preventing the word password. Almost all of them uh, block it now. You know, the notable exception that blocks nothing. Um, the, the insistence on composition. There was only one site that required it in 2007, and that was a bad thing then, uh, or a good. It was a good thing to look for then, and only one site was doing it. It's a bad thing to see now, and only one site's doing it now. It would be nice if it wasn't insisted upon because it's old practice. And dictionary words, properly filtering them out. Nobody did it in 2007, and three out of 10 sites were doing it now. So the sites that existed back in the 2007 version and were still around today for the 2022 version were, were these five. Um, so the, these have appeared, in fact, in all versions of the, of the study over the years. But let's contrast the sort of back in 2007 and now. Um, OK, Amazon has not taken great strides forward, it would seem. It didn't enforce composition in 2007. It doesn't enforce it now. And that just by chance is a good thing. Um, it has a, a minimum length. It didn't in 2007. Um, looking at Facebook, it's it's better now, other than the pretty minimal minimum length um still doesn't guide you very well but at least the enforcements are there um and yahoo and google um they were better sort of back in 2000 and they're even better still now and so you know things have moved on but there's still not you to see there's still not uniform good practice across all of these sites yeah you know, after 15 years of something that should have been right back in 2007 it still isn't right 15 years later the one area of some improvement, the minimum length of password that sites were allowing. So back in 2007, two sites allowed a one character password. Two sites were accepting a five character minimum. If I get the colors right, six sites looking for five characters and one site looking for seven, uh, looking for eight characters. These days, OK, um, there's a few sites that will require six. One requires seven and five require eight. And all of those are still too short to be uh, robust against uh, proper attack. One thing that is notable, and it was notable back in 2007, that the guidance on what good looks like and what you should consider tends to be more prominent if you elect to change your password. So don't tell you when you initially choose it when you sign up. But when you change your password, even now, Facebook, for example, now has a tip and a strength rating. It had nothing you'll remember to begin with. Um, but now there's there's um, the tip at the top. It's a good idea to use a strong password you don't use elsewhere. Okay, it's not a great tip because it still doesn't tell you what strong password is. But it does tell you and now a rating for your password strength. It tells me that one's weak. Google has two links to, to learning more about extra guidance. So um, choose a strong password and don't reuse it for other accounts. Learn more. You can follow that link. Um, use a password. Use a, at least eight characters. Don't use a password from another site or something too obvious like your pet's name. Why? And that's a link and you can find out more. And there's a strength rating. Um, it tells you in this case it's a good password. Oh, Facebook also requires you to retype your new password in the uh, in the change password thing, I guess, because you've proven you didn't remember the original one. And now you it wants you to make sure you've, you've actually understood what you've typed this time around. Um, LinkedIn, various tips on what, what a strong password looks like. We might not agree with the tips because it's insisting on complexity, but at least it's got some. Um, and it tells you it needs to be at least eight characters. Um, Yahoo, a link to some password help, a strength rating. Um, it had a meter based feedback before. Now it's got a, a, a rating and a bit of a description, but it's got more information for you. It's got the password help. So, again, you know, now we've got more, more guidance, more information. Why couldn't that have been there at sign up for the same sites? They've got it here. Why not there? And so, perhaps, why not there is you know, maybe, you know, I've got no proof for this you know, conjecture but perhaps at the point when they're trying to get you to sign up and become a new user the website operators don't want to encumber you with having to read about strong passwords or put anything that might get in your way of becoming a new sign up on their service and actually from the user perspective 
it makes it easier for us. We're not being bothered by all this stuff. We're allowed to use passwords that are less strong in some cases. And so the weaker security, the lack of guidance, the lack of it getting in the way with all these messages is perhaps making the, the, the site more usable for us. I suppose the downside of that is just it says at the bottom there, these these are leading websites. They've got a powerful voice they could offer in promoting better cybersecurity literacy for the users. So if, if people see they can get away with using passwords that are not up to grade on, on these sites, they might assume that if it's good enough for Facebook or for Instagram or whatever, then it ought to be good enough for other services. And similarly, other providers might look at, well, what do these leading sites do? And if we just mirror what they do, if we follow it, you know, six character minimum, it's good enough for them. That's what we'll have on our site. No guidance for users. Well, we won't provide guidance either because nobody else has done it. So I say that just to br briefly sort of flag up what I said right at the start, that this isn't ultimately, although I've talked and rambled on about passwords all the time, it's not just about passwords, this problem. There's two broader issues here. One is that we often find ourselves, you might well recognize this from your own experience, being expected to use security without being given the associated guidance and support about how it works, what we're supposed to do, what, what the, the different things mean. And also, yeah, the, the way this has evolved or, or hasn't over the years is quite in contrast to the surrounding technology. So think about the devices that we used back in 2007 and what we use now. Yeah, they're quite different. I mean, smartphones were only just really appearing in 2007, and now you've all got one. Tablets didn't exist, or not in the sort of usable sense that we see. Our IoT domestic devices, they, you know, they smart TVs, you didn't have them then. But that's all now around us. We've got more websites, more services that we use. And yet the notion of passwords and what they are and how we support people using them has stayed pretty much the same through all that time. And the same thing for other aspects of security. So the extent to which you know, you're expected to scan things, update things, back up things. You know, how much more support do you get now in doing those things as a user than you ever did before? And so you can still fall foul quite easily of having a system that's not up to date, not backed up, et cetera, et cetera, because the usability of the thing that's put before you is often a disincentive to doing it properly. And the, the unfortunate downside is it leaves us more exposed for all these different routes. So we, we choose weaker passwords. We have systems that remain unupdated, unbacked up, et cetera, et cetera. So finally, you'll stop talking. Um, so conclusions. So we've known about these shortcomings. I've not told you anything new here. It's my trademark. I'll come along and state the obvious and do it for about an hour. Um, yeah, we knew this before I did even the first study. 15 years later, not that much has changed. OK, there's a few more ticks and green boxes, but it could have been far better after 15 years. Um, 15 years. Um, looking beyond passwords. OK, with, we're still not giving users enough support, I would say, in terms of understanding, using and being proficient in terms of things that that they need to know to practice basic cyber hygiene. This is just one element of it. And what next for, for passwords? Well, OK, two factor authentication, multi factor authentication. We're seeing much more of this and having to use authenticator apps and you know, that brings in its own potential problems. We're now hearing about you know, users getting fed up with it and MFA fatigue being used as a means of tricking people into you know, divulging access credentials via um, those routes. There's a technology which Apple have called Passkeys, which um, basically leverages your mobile device to enable an interaction between that and the website. So you don't have to remember passwords. You use your Passkeys approach to log in and it Sort of remove some of the friction there but that requires sites to, up, to um, adopt this sort of a process so it'll be interesting to see quite how long it takes before that's a commonly available mechanism it's been available since the, the autumn of last year will these things become the user expectation will we start to to you know sort of be less satisfied with sites that don't offer us some enhancement beyond a basic puzzle well, we finally realize that this isn't enough to to protect the sites we're interested in safeguarding 
So it'll be interesting to see in sort of three to four years time whether I have the inclination to do yet another version of this study. And if I was to do so, what I might find, you know, would it be worthwhile doing a study then are enough sites still going to be using basic passwords to make that study viable? I hope so, because I'd like to write another version of the paper. It's always good fun, but it might not be the case. We shall see. And other than that, contact details there and I'll finally shut up and see if there's any questions. And indeed, any time. Thank up. you, Steve. Um, so we have some time for questions. Um, questions. I've got a question. I can kick off. Steve, can you stop sharing? Yeah, yeah. I can see. <laughs> so you can see me more fully, as yes, I know. Here I am. Oh, there you go. Uh, Steve, 